Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for the annual Professor Donald B. Gidden, DMD, PhD, annual lecture in behavioral medicine and dentistry. I know we are all looking forward to hearing from our distinguished guest, Professor Richard Watt, who I will introduce shortly. First, I'll give you a little bit of background on how this program began. The lecture series was established in 2007 by the Gidden Family Endowment and occurs in conjunction with HSDM's Student Research Day with the goal of broadening the behavioral and social science perspectives of students and faculty involved in teaching and research in oral health care. Each year, a committee selects a national or international speaker in the field of oral and behavioral medicine to join us for this opportunity. The lecture has highlighted a broad range of topics over the years, including public health, dental education, pain, stress, and disease, and facial perception, just to name a few. I'd like to thank this year's organizers for all of their efforts putting together today's program. Following this lecture, Research Day activities include 75 pre-doctoral and postdoctoral students presenting posters and 67 faculty, postdocs, and students who will be evaluating posters, all virtually. And so this tremendous amount of coordination was made possible by Don DaCosta, Director of Research Operations, Jake Jacobellis, Program Coordinator for the Office of Research, Dr. Yinsi Yang, our Dean for Research, Jane Barrow, Associate Dean for Global and Community Health and Executive Director of the Initiative to Integrate Oral Health and Medicine, and Christina Cassano, Program Coordinator for Global and Community Health and the Initiative to Integrate Oral Health and Medicine. So I'd also like to recognize Dr. Gidden for his vision and generosity in making this lecture series possible. Dr. Gidden is a dedicated alumnus and professor emeritus of HSDM, who during his distinguished career has given back to the school with gifts devoted to scholarship and research. In addition to this lecture, he has designated a seminar room for research and social behavioral sciences on the fifth floor of the REB. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker. I first had the privilege of meeting Professor Watt in 2013 when I was a visiting professor at the University College London, as well as through my interactions with him as an editorial board member of the Journal of Dental Research. He, was not only an, he not only has an impressive background as a well-known leader in global health, but he's truly a wonderful colleague and collaborator. And so he serves as professor of dental public health in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University College London and director of research for Central Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust. He earned his degree in dentistry from the University of Edinburgh in 1984 and pursued his MSc and PhD in dental public health at the University of London. His research focuses on the social determinants of oral health inequalities and the development and evaluation of health improvement interventions. In 2014, he was awarded the International Association for Dental Research Distinguished Scientist Award for Behavioral, Epidemiologic, and Health Services Research, and in 2016, the NIHR Senior Investigator Award. He has served on a variety of expert working groups for the Department of Public Health, Public Health England, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, the World Health Organization, and the European Union. He is co-author of Essential Dental Public Health, and has published more than 250 scholarly publications. Most recently, he has served as uh, most recently he has served as co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Global Oral Health, and which convened or health experts from around the world to promote access to oral health care and tackle oral health inequalities at a global level. Professor Watt, we are very honored to have you join us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. I encourage those of you who have questions uh, after or during the presentation to put them into the chat function, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. 
So Professor Watt, uh, please go ahead and begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, um, Dean Ginobili for that very kind um, invitation and introduction. And it is a great honor for me to deliver this lecture. Um, um, Dr. Giddon was in touch with me last year actually, and I was uh, actually invited to come to Boston last year, but because of the pandemic that, that was canceled, but doing it on Zoom is, is definitely a, a second best option, but I hopefully at some point will um, come back to Boston. It's a beautiful city, one of my favorite cities in the US. So I'd like to come back at some point, hopefully in the future to visit you all in person. And I would like to thank you for the invitation for this lecture and for Dr. Jane Barrow and her team for the kind organization of, of the lecture. So what I'm gonna be doing in the next 45 minutes or so is giving an overview of um, the Lancet Commission on Oral Health that um, has started um, last year. And in my presentation, what my, my plans really are, are to present an overview of the Lancet Commission on Oral Health, but mostly to highlight the background and origins of the commission, because that's, that's um, more or less where we're up to. I would also like to introduce you as an audience to some more general um, details about Lancet commissions in general, their nature and purpose. And then towards the end of my lecture, I will highlight the sort of vision and progress that we have made so far in the first year of our commission in oral health, Lancet Commission Oral Health, and then look forwards to next steps and the opportunities ahead. So in terms of the, the sort of background journey um, to where we are now, that really started um, about 18 months ago, two years ago, um, when um, in July 2019, we launched um, the Lancet series on oral health. And that was a beautiful sunny day in London. Um, and this is an image of that, of that um, launch afternoon. And in that image, you will probably recognize a few people, including Dr. Lois Cohen, who um, spoke at the end of our, our launch and has been a great supporter of myself over many years and of the current Lancet Commission. So we um, published um, this Lancet series in the uh, Lancet in 2019, July 2019. And um, as I'm sure most of you have probably seen, um, not only did we manage to publish two papers in this Lancet series, but we also managed to get um, on the front cover of Lancet, which is a pretty rare um, um, honour, and I was absolutely delighted um, with that. And in addition to the two series papers, um, there were also two commentaries and other two other supporting um, items, all focusing on the topic of oral health. And just reflecting on, on this lecture, um, I actually remember talking to Will when he was editor of JDR and sort of um, discreetly discussed with him this opportunity that had risen. And I was very excited to be approached by The Lancet to, to lead the series, which um, subsequently was published. So the two main papers um, were published um, in The Lancet. And they really cover the sort of backdrop and background to global oral health in terms of the public health challenge and in terms of the need for um, change and transformation of our um, oral health systems. That Lancet series, there were um, 13 of us who were co-authors of those two papers and we had a brilliant team that worked together very collaboratively. Um, and really shared the task um, very, very well. And the whole process really went very smoothly. But it is important to sort of reflect on um, how that actually happened. And just to explain, and I think particularly this might be of importance to more junior staff members um, in the, in, at Harvard um, Dental Faculty, because many of us are involved in teaching and we sometimes think, oh, teaching, you know, we need to be getting on with our research. But the reason that I was approached by The Lancet was actually because I was involved in a summer school 
that our department at UCL run each year, a summer school on social determinants of, of health, general health. And in that summer school, I give one half hour lecture on global oral health. Now, unbeknown to me, um, about four or five years ago, one of the members of the audience of that summer school was a junior member of the editorial team from The Lancet. And she subsequently at a meeting at The Lancet when they were discussing new topics for uh, a series, my name emerged because she'd enjoyed the lecture um, so much. So I think th the message I'm trying to make here is that the opportunities for us to communicate our core messages to an audience, we should always make the assumption that somebody in that audience could be a key decision maker that might lead on to, to greater things. And for me, you know, that's a real lesson to take home. So looking at what the, the, the core messages were in those two Lancet papers, it really was quite a simple message that we um, communicated in those two papers. And the simple message really comprised of demonstrating to the broader Lancet readership, the global public health importance of oral diseases. Oops. Um, oh dear. Let me go back, sorry. Technically, here we go. Um, so yeah, the global public health importance of oral diseases. And what we did really was communicate a few simple messages about the prevalence of oral diseases, the disparities in oral health inequalities around oral diseases, the impact of oral diseases, and the need for transformation and reform of oral health systems. So let me just share you those core messages. So in terms of prevalence, in the papers, using mostly the global burden of disease data, we demonstrated the very high prevalence of oral diseases, both dental caries, periodontal disease, tooth loss, and lip and oral cavity cancers. And, you know, important advocacy message, 3.5 billion people around the world are affected by oral conditions. And that's an important message that people really took away. Next important message that we really demonstrated was the data we have globally on oral health inequalities in relation to a range of clinical subjective measures. We present the data on caries, periodontal disease, oral cancers, and we demonstrated the social gradients that universally exist both in high, middle and low income countries. And this notion of a cliff edge of the most marginalized and most disadvantaged groups having the extreme levels of inequality, such as people, homeless people, people with long term illnesses or disabilities, those groups we know have particular um, inequalities. Working with the Lancet, they have incredibly um, experience communication and PR team. So they translated some of our core messages into um, important infographics such as this to really take home the message about the nature of inequalities across marginalized and excluded groups. And again, that message seems to, to, to resonate with the, the, the Lancet editorial team. Based upon the research, much of which has been carried out in the US and Canada, um, we also reported on the individual and societal impact of oral diseases um, across the life course. Now, most of us, I assume, on this um, particular webinar are from an oral health background, but over the last 15, 20 years, we have now accumulated some very powerful evidence on the impact of oral diseases in the broader sense. And again, that message in terms of an advocacy message has really began to, to be noticed by our broader um, collaborators elsewhere. And I think um, very recently, Professor Stefan Listel um, spoke at a seminar at Harvard and Stefan um, 
a member of the, um, the Lancet series papers and indeed of the commission now, um, his expertise in economic analysis was again a useful piece of information that again demonstrating the, the broader impact of oral diseases. And this particular slide just demonstrates some analysis that Stefan conducted looking at the costs of different chronic diseases across the European Union and showed that oral diseases, dental diseases, were the third most expensive condition at 90 billion euros per year, um, you know, a major, major cost to healthcare systems across Europe. What we also did in the series, which was important and which the Lancet editorial team really encouraged us to focus on, was this combined analysis of the social and commercial determinants of oral diseases. So again, many of you from a public health background will be familiar with the WHO framework on health inequalities that highlight the structural determinants, the socioeconomic, political, and environmental context. That overriding influence then on the intermediate determinants in terms of social position and social circumstances, psychosocial factors, availability of services, etc which then um, ultimately interact on the proximal determinants, the behaviours and biological factors that many of us in dental research have been very familiar with, but the WHO model really places the emphasis on those broader structural and inter intermediate determinants that ultimately influence um, oral health outcomes um, and in oral health inequalities. But what we did was also combine this emerging field of the commercial determinants of chronic disease and looked at the various corporate strategies that the tobacco, alcohol and sugar industries often adopt to promote their products and maximize their um, influence and, and profit margins. And you can see the lower margins of this image the different political, economic, lobbying, influences, etc., that these um, commercial determinants um, are well known and, and understood for. So one thing that we covered in, in the Lancet series was the really major public health importance, not just from an oral health, but from a general public health, of, of sugar and sugar production and the broader um, commercialization of, of food and food and drinks. And this was just a demonstration of the global production of sugar beet and sugar cane, how that has steadily increased um, across the world in recent years. And um, what we also highlighted very importantly and you're know, linking very much to the work that Mary and Nestle and others have done is looking at the power and influence of, of big sugar in terms of the economic power. And this slide just highlights again from a nice sort of Lancet um, infographic element that Coca-Cola spending $12 billion on marketing their products across Africa, emerging economies that they know is a potential place for increasing sales. PepsiCo spending $5.5 billion per year on its Indian operations by 2020. And in contrast, the WHO's total budget, total budget, not just oral health budget, but total budget is 4.4 billion as in 2017. So we, we can see the relative um, power and influence of these different players from a commercial side. And the final thing that we did really in the, the Lancet series was also critically reflect on the current limitations of dental healthcare systems across the globe. And we did that really by trying to look at the evidence and summarize what we know are the limitations of oral, oral healthcare systems. And a quote directly from that Lancet paper is, dentistry is in a state of crisis. Now, some people might argue that might be a bit too um, alarmist, but I think in many parts of the world, that is an, an accurate 
indicator of the problems that dentistry is currently facing. To summarize some of those limitations that we reviewed the evidence on, um, I think all of us on this webinar will agree that in terms of the balance of focus between treatment, prevention and health promotion, dentistry around the world is still very heavily focused on a treatment um, regime. There is a major mismatch between the oral health needs of their populations and the availability and location of oral health services. You know, the classic inverse care law applies very much to oral health. And that application is in high income countries like the US, like the UK, as well as middle and certainly um, very acutely in low income countries. Payment systems around the world tend to incentivize dental professionals to intervene, to treat, um, and that, as we know, often leads to overtreatment. So the payment systems that we often have in our, um, syst our delivery systems often do not incentivize health and prevention. I know a major issue that colleagues at Harvard have been very interested in is this problem of the dental silo, the compartmentalization, separation of oral health from general health. So around the world, many of us in oral health care systems are separated, isolated from the mainstream health systems. And that isolation and separation leads to many, many problems and limitations. Another very common universal limitation of current dental health care systems is the poor and inadequate planning that is often conducted. That planning may in focus on such issues as personnel planning, the inappropriate or poor use of the wider dental team. And I know in some countries there's a real pushback from dental associations about the, the use of dental hygienists, dental therapists, expanded dental nurses, etc. And you know that is a real um, limitation in, in, in medicine, in primary care medicine now, that use of the wider team, that use of the wider skill mix is so much further developed than in dentistry. And another limitation, one that I've been particularly interested in in my academic career, is the limitation individualized preventive approach that has often been adopted within oral health. So rather than looking at a broader public health or upstream approach, prevention when it is delivered often tends to be in a clinical environment on a one-to-one -one basis only, and it ignores the, the broader social and commercial determinants that we've highlighted previously. So at the end of the, the launch of the um, Lancet series, we had a very important member of the audience there. And, and in some ways, the audience of, at that launch really consisted of one in, individual, that is Dr. Richard Horton, editor-in-chief of the Lancet. So he listened and sat in on the whole afternoon at the launch in our um, July um, seminar. And at the end, he then spoke. Now, hopefully, many of you in this webinar will have heard Richard Horton speak, but he is a very inspirational, very um, talented speaker that captures the essence of the issue exceptionally well. And just to quote a couple of um, phrases from, from his, Richard Horton's final words, he mentioned that this was an extraordinary opportunity to move ahead in oral health but he felt we were way too polite as a community and we need to sharpen up our anger at the problems that we um, are currently facing. But in summary, at that event, Richard Horton made a, a public commitment that the Lancet wanted to move forward with the topic of oral health and wanted to establish a Lancet Commission on oral health based upon the evidence and arguments that we presented um, in our series. So that really was the, the ultimate outcome from our work. So what I'd like to do now is to give you, um, as an audience, a, a brief overview of what a Lancet Commission is. 
Um, because I think most of us probably have not been involved in a Lancet Commission before. So I thought it'd be useful just to explain a little bit of details of what the Lancet Commission comprises and its purpose. So a Lancet Commission is a scientific review, inquiry and response to a neglected health predicament. Lancet Commissions are science-led, international, multidisciplinary collaborations aiming to achieve transformational change with a particular focus on policy and political action. Ingredients of a successful commission comprise of the following sort of core messages. First, to be present a bold and transformative message. Secondly, to develop a compelling and convincing storyline. Third, to devise an original and innovative idea. Next, to offer critical and challenging view for change be forward thinking and convene a great group of people with gender and geographical balance that collectively can be inspiring and optimistic in their message, that can think big and bold and provide actionable conclusions for political, policy and professional audiences. And very importantly, with Lancet Commissions to create an active afterlife to achieve longer term sustainable impact. So these ingredients of a successful Lancet Commission were presented to us by um, Dr. Jocelyn Clark, who is um, one of the executive editors at the Lancet, and tried to really summarize for, for me certainly um, what the ingredients of a successful commission are. Now, what we can say is at present, there are actually um, over 30 Lancet commissions either being published or in process. And um, on this web link here, you can, you'll be able to link onto that site and see the whole range of commissions that have um, been published. And I think it's an important message to, to make that the Lancet clearly is famous for its medical journal you know, the second highest ranking journal in, in the world. The Lancet have a whole um, suite of, of papers, I think over 20 papers and journals rather, that cover a whole range of areas of medicine, public health, global health, etc. But really importantly, the Lancet commissions are also a core element of business for the Lancet editorial um, team. They see these commissions as being a core element of their publishing agenda. So let's now um, introduce you and update you on the progress of the Lancet Commission on Oral Health. So that was really formed um, initially following the, the launch meeting in July 2019. And um, what we have now um, compiled is a group of 37 um, commissioners from all over the world. So you can see on this slide, um, literally we have a spread of commissioners from 17 countries. And as I say, we've got 27 commissioners that have been appointed. Carol and myself were asked to be co-chairs. I was delighted to be asked as a co-chair for the Lancet Commission. And Carol is from Bogota in Colombia and comes from a public health and public health background. So both of us are the co-chairs of this Lancet Commission. But what we have is a really outstanding group of 37 commissioners in total from a whole range of different disciplinary backgrounds. Now, I don't want to go through the whole list of, of names. Um, some of people you will recognise the faces, but I just want to highlight a, a few examples of people you may not be aware of. One example is Alucio, who is um, from the south of Brazil, and he is an epidemiologist um, with a great deal of experience in health equity. He's been involved in several previous Lancet um, papers and is a real world leader in the issue of, of health equity. Another very important um, commissioner we have is Mary Jane. Mary Jane is from Canada. She is a dentist, 
but she also is a senator in the Canadian Parliament, so she combines politics with dentistry and is a very important person in terms of her insights into policy and um, policy change. Another important um, example is Katie. So Katie he leads from the UK the um, North NCD Alliance, which is a global organization um, working to combat non-communicable diseases. So in terms of the links between oral diseases and other NCDs, Katie is a, a really key figure for us to collaborate with. Next person to highlight in this slide is Judith. Judith is from Hong Kong. She's a public health doctor who for the last 40 years has been working in the field of tobacco control. And Judith has been very, very influential in achieving major change in tobacco reduction through a whole range of advocacy and scientific um, endeavors. Again, an important colleague for us to learn many lessons from. Couple more names just to highlight from our, our, our list of commissioners. Mira is from India, from the um, central India. And Mira is um, a leader in community development and in community empowerment. She works with a national organization, community organization in India, working with women's groups to become more involved in a whole range of societal efforts. Another example of a commissioner is Shumi, is from Japan, and he is a senior public health a member of the um, Japanese administration, heavily involved in influencing policy development in Japan in terms of health services and public health. And then maybe lastly, um, I'll mention Mira, Miriam rather. Miriam is the chief dentist in Kenya. So she is a clinical dentist, chief dentist working in Kenya, um, a country that's got many issues and challenges, but again, it's great to have somebody who's a chief dentist with that policy and um, clinical um, background. So as you can see, really how we have a, a, an interesting and diverse mix of individuals and time doesn't permit me to give all the names and details, but um, we've got a great, great team. And what's very important um, from Lancet's perspective is that team is balanced in terms of diversity, both in terms of gender diversity, but also between high and middle and low income country setting. And what we have is a group that really is um, superbly balanced, um, both in terms of gender and geography, which really collectively provides a, a wonderful opportunity for us to move forwards. So progress to date. Well, our first meeting was held on the 12th and 13th of March in 2020 at the Lancet offices in London. So we held a two day meeting to, to kickstart the, the work. And at that meeting, we formulated uh, a draft vision and set of priorities for our commission work. We established three core working groups to develop further work plans and, and um, plans ahead for what we will be working on. And since then, we've held regular um, remote meetings on Zoom. There's been some internal presentations and lots of discussion and debate um, about the direction of our travel. And we started working forwards now on some initial research um, as part of the Commission's agenda. So this is a, a picture of our first meeting, as I say, in um, March the 12th um, last year. And obviously, all of you will realize this uh, actually was the last time that I was physically in a group meeting with more than one person. Um, so this just happened before the global pandemic really struck. So it was quite amazing that we had people from, I think, 15 countries travel to London. And we were exceptionally lucky that nobody um, contracted um, COVID-19, either in terms of travel or by being in London, um, and never managed to get home eventually safely, although travel plans were severely curtailed because of the um, emerging pandemic. But that picture sort of captures the last time, as I say, um, we were in a group setting, and I very much look forward to, to getting back to such meetings. 
at that um, London meeting, what we did was we um, brainstormed our plans and we've initially um, came up with a mission. Now this might change as we move forward, but our mission at present is to sustainably improve global oral health and promote equity in terms of population oral health status, access to services and, and quality of care, both within and between countries. In terms of our vision, our vision, um, as agreed at this first meeting, um, was to raise the political and policy profile of oral health at international, national and community levels, to promote population oral health equity and to address oral health inequalities, to reform and transform oral health care systems, and to challenge vested interest groups that undermine population oral health. And what we also um, clarified and agreed that the audience for our Commission on Oral Health, Lancet Commission on Oral Health, is very much looking at politicians, policymakers, and professional leaders around the world. And a really important message to highlight is that Lancet commissions are not really just about people in low and middle income countries, they are very much, very much also about all of us who are living in high income countries. A very big gap that we want to begin to address is the need to engage more successfully with civil society movements, so putting oral health onto the agenda of many civil society movements. As an audience, we also want to engage with the broader public health and global health communities, because as many of us in this webinar will acknowledge, oral health has often been a neglected area amongst that particular audience. But lastly, we also do want to um, engage with the oral health community, National Dental Association, education and training sector, and of course, the, the, the dental research community are all um, key audiences for us as we move forward. So this slide just tries to sort of summarize the sort of key priorities that we identified at our initial opening meeting on governance and advocacy for global oral health, equity, social justice and oral health, the need for health system reform, governance and transformation, and action to tackle commercial determinants. Now, these are the sort of key priorities that we are initially working on, but there are important cross-cutting themes that link across um, these, these four priorities. The need for responsive oral health services and policy that um, links and integrates oral and general health. The importance of social and community empowerment understanding that change and transformation can not only be led by professional action, but also need um, to have community and civil engagement support. The recognition that many of our challenges are universal, but our solutions also need to be locally orientated. So there would be no point or it would be very inappropriate for a commission to come up with very broad guidance and recommendations and expect that to apply in every setting um, across the globe, issues need to be responsive to local needs and local community characteristics. The issue of intersectoral collaboration and integration is absolutely core, and hence the need for such a collaborative, um, cross-disciplinary range of commissioners that we're working around. Capacity building and workforce development, um, linking back to one of the key limitations I mentioned earlier on, about the lack of the use of the broader dental team within the delivery and prevention of oral diseases. That's the key issue, um, a key cross-cutting theme in terms of education and training. And lastly, um, the need for research and policy integration, again, a linking across these issues of equity, system reform, governance, etc. So some cross-cutting themes as well as the the um, key priorities. So next steps. Um, I have to say, I think 
because of the pandemic, our plans, we originally had been planning to meet as a group of commissioners um, face to face um, at least twice over the last year. But because obviously with the pandemic that has not been possible, um, our progress has perhaps been a little bit slower than we might have originally planned. And we've met with Richard Horton and Jocelyn Clark at the Lancet and they very much understand and, and support um, that. But in terms of, of moving ahead, what we are currently doing across our three working groups is a programme of research is now beginning to take place in terms of collecting and analysing new data in relation to inequalities, system reform, outcome measures um, and governance and um, policy agendas. We're going to be broadening our seminar series to include a wider range of speakers and broaden the audience in which we um, engage with. As we move further forward, what we will also do is start undertaking a process of, of external consultation with key stakeholders to really consult with a wider global audience to make sure that um, the issues that we are prioritizing are the right issues that people can sign up to them and, and um, give feedback and comment. We will eventually publish the final report and undoubtedly have other publications linked to the report. And very importantly, as mentioned before, we are beginning to plan also ahead for the afterlife once the commission document is um, published but that isn't the end of the story, that almost is the beginning, because there's a sort of longer term agenda that linked to the sort of broader um, afterlife that the, the, the Lancet is very keen to support. Now, I think it's, before I finish, I think it's also important that we recognise that there are a range of other initiatives that are happening currently that are very much synergistic and linked to this Lancet Commission on Oral Health. So for a US audience, I thought it's very important that we acknowledge, and I understand it will be published in 2021, is the US General's, um, General's report on oral health, which will, from my understanding, cover a range of topic areas that although with a very much US centric focus, actually have some synergy and link to some of the issues that I've been describing that we are covering in the Lancet Commission. Also, hopefully many of you have seen the FDI's um, recent publication, Delivering Optimal Oral Health for All, the Vision 2030 document, which is a great example of how the FDI has really moved into a global health space that is looking at a range of initiatives to reform, transform dental services, et cetera. And again, the synergies and links with what we're planning in our commission are, are very strong. And lastly, again, hopefully many of you have been, have been observing the real developments that Benoit at WHO has been um, achieving in recent months in terms of raising the profile of oral health at the WHO headquarters and across the world. So the recent um, WHO executive board meeting in January was an enormous success to see oral health being um, focused upon, discussed, supported, acknowledged as being an important global public health challenge. And Benoit and his, and his team are now working on the global oral health report a global action plan and various other documents that collectively will really um, move forwards in terms of the WHO agenda on oral health. Again, synergies and linking to the Lancet Commission. So in conclusion, um, what I've tried to do in this um, webinar is really highlight the simple messages that we communicated in our Lancet um, series papers on the global public health importance of oral diseases and inequalities. The limitations and the need for real change, real innovation, bold innovation within the reform of our oral healthcare systems around the world. And that transformation agenda really requires um, policy, research, 
and advocacy support. So really we have a unique opportunity um, with both the Lancet Commission and WHO, FDI and other um, agendas to collectively um, have a lot of, of commonalities. And ultimately, we always need collaboration and joint action with our research community, with our training and education colleagues, and of course, with policymakers. So that for me is the, is the core conclusions of where we are so far. And in that Lancet um, series, they had a very useful and sort of poignant um, phrase, oral health at a tipping point. And I really truly believe that we are at a tipping point one that is exciting, one which offers a range of opportunities that we really must move forward with. So I'd like to thank uh, a few organisations in terms of my acknowledgement. The Burrow Foundation have very generously um, supported financially to enable the Commission to meet um, both face-to-face -face and remotely. I also received funding from uh, my University College London Faculty of Population Health and the BRC Centre and also supported um, the Lancet Commission. And I would also like to um, acknowledge all the hard work of the 37 commissioners that have been working together, the Lancet editorial team who have provided some really um, strong support and guidance, and also my wider UCL team for their support and um, assistance. So thank you very much for listening. And now it would be great to open up for time for questions and discussions and and um, Dean Ginobili is going to help I think with the 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 the, um, the question and answer session okay thank you so much Richard that was truly an amazing presentation and I think for you to give us this overview on what it takes to be a part of a Lancet Commission series uh, it was very interesting you provided so much of that background and uh, I was very excited to see that actually there are several members of your team that are here today uh, as a part of this uh, presentation listening in. And I think that you, your team has been very successful in creating this active afterlife uh, since this was published in 2019. So uh, there's, there's so much information for us. And I think as a part of our research day, and having this very broad audience of people involved in basic science research and translational research, and then looking at clinical application and policy implications. I think you gave a perfect presentation to demonstrate how important it is for research to be integrated at a policy level uh, for us to have the greatest impact. And so I really uh, appreciated you know, hearing your words from that. I, I had, maybe I'll kick it off with uh, one question and then I see that we're starting to get uh, questions coming into the chat. Um, you mentioned that uh, towards the end, you know, oral health at a tipping point and uh, even some of the comments made by uh, Dr. Horton in terms of that it's very important for, you know, dentistry to recognize that it is at a crisis point. And you said that that wasn't just hyperbole. It is, uh, as we look at, you know, in both high income, middle and uh, low income countries, that there are so many different uh, considerations as it relates to the determinants of oral health and uh, bringing those communities together. What would you say as we talk about this crisis uh, in uh, oral health and within dentistry that when we have the groups from using more of the surgical model focused on treatment versus those on the medical model looking at prevention and you know, the diagnosis of diseases, how, how do you think we can bridge this gap uh, within our communities? Well, I think you know, that's a really fundamental question. And I, and I think if I reflect on my own career, um, in, the, in the last sort of 37 years that I've been a dentist, I think early in my career, we wouldn't even have had that question. That question wouldn't have even been raised. But to have you as a Dean of Harvard Dental School to be even engaging with that and recognizing that challenge just demonstrates how far we have come. And I think, 
really the first step is to have an open and reflective and critical um, discussion on the problems that our systems do face. And I think one of the interesting um, responses that we got when we did publish the, the papers in Lancet, and I won't mention the countries because that might be a bit inappropriate, but, but certain high income countries really um, deflected any criticism about their systems and really said, look, this is only a problem. The crisis in dentistry is only in low income developing countries. Well, that fails to acknowledge that our current system isn't working for the whole populations, that whether it's the US, Europe, UK, South America, you know, the inequalities that exist, there are so many people that do not gain access to care that is affordable, that's appropriate, that's sustainable in terms of the good oral health. So I think, I think recognizing amongst our communities of researchers, health professionals, um, educators, to have an open discussion now about we need to change things is such a big point. And I think increasingly, I've, I feel confident that that discussion is now happening. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I think we have a long way to go in that regard. But I think, as you said, this Lancet series has really brought to bear many of these considerations, I think. Uh, okay, so we've got uh, some, some nice questions coming in. So uh, here's a question. I'd like to ask your view on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the future of world health. Did we have progress towards more conservative, less invasive treatments, value of prevention, or will the negative impact of the pandemic, for example, reduced access to dental care prevail? Well, I think you know, that, that raises a really good question because I think the choice is almost ours. We either can move forward in a more progressive, inclusive way, learning from the, the pandemic and building back in a fairer way, because I think many people who have analysed the pandemic, the last thing we want to do is to go back to normal of how we were before, because that really isn't learning the lessons from the last you know, 16 months. Um, so I think from my perspective, the issues of inequalities, access, um, poor outcomes, the pandemic has heightened those. So to move forward, we need to think of more innovative solutions Teledentistry, more engaged prevention, better integration. You know, there are a whole range of things that could happen as we move now forward post pandemic in terms of the recovery phase. But for me, we should not go back to the old normal ways. We need to move forward in a fairer, more constructive manner. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. In terms of breaking down silos, rehires, either redesign of former formal organizational structures, which can be costly and slow, or identification and implementation of activities that facilitate boundary crossing and cultural changes. What would you consider uh, would be well, the I, approach? I think, again, there's not one solution that fits all, but again, reflecting on the pandemic experience. And I, and I think this may have been the same in the, in the US, but in, in the UK, a fair proportion, not, not them all, but a significant proportion of dental personnel were redeployed into frontline um, clinical roles at the peak of the pandemic. So I have some clinical colleagues that as, as dentists were then moved across to work either in hospital or community settings, doing a whole range of different tasks in acute medicine, essentially, coping with, with the pandemic. Now, that would never have happened before where our professional boundaries were so rigid, but in a crisis, you know, innovation, bold decision-making in terms of policy, in terms of redeployment, et cetera, happened. And I think it demonstrated that we can work jointly much more effectively. Now, moving forwards, I know, um, I don't know if Michael clicks on the call, but Michael and others in the US have been talking about the importance of, for example, COVID testing in dental practice settings. There's a whole range of ways in which um, opportunities for integration linkage can move forward. Um, and I think 
those need to be tailored to the system in which we're working. So I work within the National Health Service, which is obviously very different than a US system. So mm -hmm. each of these innovations need to fit in to the, the, the system that, that we're, we're operating in as clinicians. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that came through the Q&A. Uh, how do you see this impacting the dentist of the future? How and in what discipline should we be educating them? Well, well, actually, what, one point that that raises is that the one thing um, that the Lancet were very keen on doing with um, the commission and indeed with the series is having a mix of, of, of individuals involved at different points in their career. So people like me have been around for probably too long, but we've got a lot of younger, early career people involved um, because I think the future is essentially the next generation. Um, and one very important group that we need to engage with is the dental student community. And um, at various presentations and meetings and um, pre-pandemic, a lot of the representatives from the dental student community came forward and were very excited by what the Lancet Commission and Sirius were offering because I think they can see the opportunities that lie ahead for them as, as future members of the profession. So I, I very much hope actually, as, as our commission moves forward, that we have an arm that engages with students and early career um, professionals to really engage with them and, and have their um, opportunity to have a voice and a dialogue about the, the way ahead, because it needs to fit that model. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that came through the Q&A with respect to elders and in light of the Seattle Care Pathways, how do you think that the integration of community-based prevention with other services in elder housing and senior centers dovetails with the upstream approach to prevention and pre-frailty? I think it absolutely does. And um, I'm involved in the UK in a few projects working on oral health and older people. And I think, you know, we know that there are such major um, levels of high level of need in that community that are not being met by the traditional dental services that are available. So I think the oral health of older people is absolutely critical. Um, the issues around oral health and frailty, as you mentioned in your question, are really important. And I've been very lucky and very fortunate to work with colleagues in Japan who have got a lot of active research programs on the older population, again, integrating across areas. So the JAGES project is a Japanese aging um, cohort that oral health is very much embedded in. Um, I know in the US you've got HRS, which has got oral health data, and in, in the UK we've got English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which again we've now managed to have oral health input into those um, research projects around oral health. So the, the transformation of services around the care of older people is the next sort of major priority, I think, for, for um, system reform. Okay. Thank you. Uh, here's another question that came through. Uh, in your mission, you refer to promote equity. Would you would that include or be shifted to equality, where in preventive medicine, equity has sometimes led to overtreatment on one hand, whereas still undertreated with other groups? And how is the medical world involved in recognizing a range of diseases left? Under undiagnosed that have a high likelihood to have originated in the oral cavity and refer to an adequate dentist oral expert? Well, I think I think that's that's the kind of question that would probably need to be teased out a little bit because there's lots of different issues in there. But to me, equity is about fairness, it's about opportunity, and it's about social justice. So promoting equity is fundamental. Um, equality to me is we're never going to be all equal, but what we want is a system that is as fair and um, provides opportunity as much as, as possible. So for me, that's where equity is an important um, aspiration that we can move forward with. 
Um, so for me, that's my understanding of equity. The issue of, of treatment, over-treatment, I'm not entirely sure how that relates to the issue of equity, but for me, equity is about social justice and opportunity and a, a fair system. Okay. Uh, a question came through on, on a global scale, if you have to name one change or progress since the publication of the Lancet series that gives you the most gratification, what would that be? <laughs> um, that's a difficult question. Well, I, I, I was very proud of the, the, um, the Lancet publication, but the one person who wasn't very proud of it was my mother, because she was very unimpressed about um, the Lancet um, publication. And I tried to convince her that actually it was potentially an important um, step forward for my career, but she was far from impressed. So um, I think I still need to convince my mother that it's an important publication before I can claim anything that's of global significance. Okay, what didn't she like about it? Just... Uh, well, <laughs> I think I th my analysis with some other friends from Scotland is if you've got a Scottish mother, they tend to be quite critical I'm sure mothers in North America would be delighted and proud and would be over the moon, whereas from Scotland, they tend to be less, less giving with their praise. Okay. Um, here's a question. What uh, are the world views as dentists, as vaccinator in the US states are dealing with the policy on this? And so uh, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well, again, I, th I think that really depends on the locals country circumstances. Um, in the UK, um, a whole range of people have been involved in vaccinators. Um, and, I've, and we were talking beforehand, but you know, the UK and the US have done very badly in terms of the pandemic, in terms of number of deaths, in terms of control of the pandemic, but they have had successful um, vaccination programs. Now, that in itself is interesting because one argument we could say from the UK is that we've got a nationalised health system. Is that the reason we've been successful with our vaccination programme? But clearly in the US, you don't have a nationalised system. So the, the analysis and reasons for the success of vaccination programmes in different countries is a really interesting research question in itself. Um, countries in mainland Europe at the moment are not doing well with their vaccination program, but they've got very well developed healthcare systems. So, you know, there are lots of questions that are still raised about the pandemic and the response, but I think the oral health community is definitely can be part of that solution if, if they are recognised as, as an integrated element of, of mm. the broader health community. Yeah, and here's a uh, question regarding the integration again. Uh, you spoke about involving stakeholders to affect change. Who are these stakeholders we need to engage to address the inequalities in the system and make oral health more accessible and affordable for all? Well, I think um, that, I keep on saying the same question on my answer around so dependent on the system you're in, but I know in my system, that means senior policymakers that are involved in commissioning services. So we recently had a meeting um, discussing um, the dental services within the National Health Service and how inequality is still a big problem. So we need to look at how we fund the oral health services to ensure that those populations with highest levels of need receive treatment in a fair and equitable fashion. So that's funding decisions, so that's budgetary decisions, but it's also planning, location of services. So that's wider um, policy dis discussions with different stakeholders. I, I think a really important group as a stakeholder that we haven't engaged with very successfully is the broader community groups in terms of civil society and for me, one of the big, big challenges I want to try and really work on through the Commission is, is beginning to understand more how we can be successful at working with community organisations, civil society, because as a stakeholder, they are often a very influential um, group to, to influence policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you brought up as you broke down these different determinants of oral health, I thought it was very interesting. And it's obviously a big area are the commercial 
uh, determinants of health. And uh, you gave the example of sugar sweetened beverage industry reaching into Africa and other underdeveloped uh, countries and how they are having the impact. It was a similar problem with opioids in Africa as well. What are some of your thoughts for us to better tackle this problem? I think, I think one of the thoughts is that we now need to understand more in a more sophisticated manner the, the, the range of commercial players that are within our field of, of oral health. Now, some of those commercial players are advantageous and positive and can have a, a, a positive role in terms of promoting oral health and in terms of improving our services and design of services, etc. But some of the organizations and agencies have, have very different agendas. And I think we need a much more transparent and clear dialogue between commercial industry, commercial interests rather, in both dental research and dental policy, um, in training, etc. So I think more transparency and clarity of funding sources, conflicts of interest, that is in itself a, a major major um, challenge that we need to address. Okay. Uh, here's a question regarding what previous Lancet Commission on any health issue has had the greatest impact in terms of driving change at a policy level and improving population health. So you mentioned these different commissions that have been have been ongoing. Well, that that is an excellent question. And to be perfectly Honest, I don't have the answer for that one because I'm I'm a, a sort of new kid on the block in terms of, of Lancet commissions. Um, in some ways, that question should be um, directed to Richard Horton um, for it for his insight. But but one thing I have heard him mention is that one of the um, successes from Lancet commissions has been, for example, the um, focus on infant and child mortality. And I think one of the first commissions that they established was addressing the inequalities around infant mortality rates around the world and the need to really get the first thousand days um, of life um, in a sort of positive um, sense. So I think that is one of their successes. Um, but I mean, I would be interested almost to raise that question when we've got a panel discussion with some of your other colleagues from Harvard when we're gonna be discussing other Commission Lancet commissions on, on their insights to that, that particular point. Yeah, I think that that could be a, a good discussion topic at this noon time uh, in Eastern US time discussion. Uh, there is a question regarding the intersections of health. Are there inter other intersections of health like water, for example, uh, that are connecting as, as it relates to oral health? Most certainly, most certainly, and, and that would link both to structural determinants of health in terms of basic sanitation, water supplies, etc. But obviously also links to such things as water fluoridation, community water fluoridation um, as a public health measure in the US you know, is a major success for your system. Um, so that is an example of advocacy intersection between a whole set of sectors um, both in terms of structural as well as health planning um, policy etc okay there was a question in terms of the makeup i mean it was an, an amazing uh, diversity of members of the uh, panel and uh, how you broke it out between uh, low middle and high income countries uh, that was very impressive uh, there was also a question about are there any dual degree dentist physician members on the panel and how did that cross-fertilization work? Um, I don't think there are any dual um, dental medical um, professionals on the commission, but what there are, um, and I didn't go around them all, but there are some examples of people, for example, there's somebody from Thailand, Supreda, he is the head of the Thai Health Promotion Agency. So that's the national agency in Thailand that is about prevention of NCDs in, in the broader sense. Now he's a dentist, so he originally qualified as a dentist, did his PhD in, in, in dentistry, but then moved into to broader fields. So there are certainly people who have worked in both dentistry and in broader, in broader health. And, and I think that's an important 
um, insight to have really of both both elements. Yeah, covered very thoroughly. Uh, question in your oral health. Uh, two article, you talked about the need for system change. What are some of the obstacles that you see in affecting that? Well, I think um, some in some places, the dental professional organization, national professional organizations may be resistant to change in certain places. Now, I can speak from the UK and the British Dental Association historically might have been opposed to a range of things that I would think that are actually very important. But now I will really give them credit that the British Dental Association are interested in the issue of inequalities. They're interested in the issues of prevention and health promotion. They have organized um, seminars on sugar reduction. So the, the previous organizations that may have been obstacles, I think are beginning to become much more engaged with this agenda. And that's one example I could give. In other countries, professional organizations may, may still be resistant. I think, again, it depends on the local context and the local um, circumstances. Okay, we just had a question that came up. Uh, since, the oral Lan since the Lancet series, the importance of oral health as an integral part of health in general has been asserted. Still, there is nothing on oral health in the SDGs. Do, how do you see the possibility of a real integration of oral health into a next set of development goals? Well, that, that person is absolutely right. The sustainable development goals are really fundamental um, in terms of, sort of policy levers. And I think a very valid point, we, we didn't really cover that in, in significant detail in our in our papers, um, but it's a very important issue. Now, I know other members of our commissioners are, are particularly working that area. I won't go through a whole list of names of them, but several people are really focusing on that agenda because I think there are at least five or six sustainable development goals that oral health can link into but we need to really explore and exploit that linkage more directly. And I think, and, and maybe one point I would like to make actually is, um, some people criticize that the Lancet papers has been nothing new. And, and to be honest, I think that's a fair comment. I think what they really did was really pull together the existing evidence that many of us in this webinar have been working with for many, many years. But the point was, that we had the opportunity to communicate that message to a bigger audience. And I think we did that, but it really wasn't anything substantially new in terms of our message, but the audience that we managed to engage with were new. And this issue of sustainable development goals is one that I think many of us recognize as being fundamentally important. And I know Benoit Varian at the WHO and others are very much working on this as a topic of, of development. Um, so I think it's something we will definitely need to do much more on. Okay, here's a, a good question regarding uh, the commercial determinants as well. Have there been discussions as yet on socially responsible public-private partnerships to advance population oral health? Important point, important point. So far, that discussion hasn't happened, but I think um, that discussion may well come. That discussion may well come. And I think, um, you know, the reality is in the vast majority of the world's economies, we work in a, in a um, capitalist system where companies are producing goods that sell, make profits. That's the system which we all work. So I think this whole issue of private-public partnerships is an important one. And I think what we might want to do is look at examples of where they have been successful, where in terms of public health gains, those partnerships have worked. We might also want to look at examples where they haven't been successful. And, and I can think of one example in the UK that um, in previous um, years, there was an agreement between industry and the government around advertising of high fat, high sugary foods and drinks to the population, that there would be a code of practice that, that the industry would follow. 
Well, in actual fact, they didn't follow that. That, that partnership didn't produce public health gains because there wasn't sufficient levers of monitoring control. So sometimes these things do work, but sometimes they do not work. And I think that in itself would be an interesting analysis for, for our commission to, to look at. Okay, and then a question that's a bit of a follow-up as well is one area of potential intersection with SDG would be preservation of teeth. Uh, as a periodontist, I'm always interested in this topic. Uh, the Japanese have made tremendous gains through the 80-20 goals. Is this an area of potential collaboration? What are your thoughts? Um, I hadn't thought about it quite in those terms. Um, I, I think the the preservation of teeth in terms of number of teeth is important. So somebody from my background is, I've done quite a lot of work and we know that the number of teeth is an important um, association with a range of other health um, markers. So I think retaining teeth into adult, later adulthood is an important goal. I'm not sure we need 32 teeth. And I think, you know, the whole notion of, of a functional dentition in terms of nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, is an important one. How that links to SDGs, I would need to think a bit more, but I would certainly agree um, the, rest of the, the maintenance of a functional dentition in, in later life is a really important goal globally, and one which I think you know, both services and research need to um, do more work on. Okay. Uh, we also had a, a question, uh, need versus demand. Uh, how does this figure into the whole calculus? Well, I think it does figure, and I think the, the challenge we have that most of our services are demand-led, and, and that creates its own problems in terms of inequity and inequalities. Um, so demand-led services, um, by their nature, can lead to major, major problems. So from a public health perspective, um, assessing need at a population level and responding in, a, in, a, in an appropriate fashion is an, is an important way of, of reforming systems to move away from that only being a demand-led service. So I think that's one of the core challenges with dentistry and particularly with private dentistry. Okay. Um, what are some, you know, it's encouraging to hear how the, the commission is continuing to move forward with the research agenda. Uh, what are some examples of the research that the commission is currently embarking on? Well, one example is um, one of the working groups is currently um, has been collating data from national surveys around the world. And what they're going to do is, a, is an analysis, a global analysis around inequalities in oral health, looking at different outcomes and different socioeconomic and other markers of disadvantage. So currently, as we speak, um, that group have been contacting um, people, uh, I think it's at least 40 countries have responded to um, provide access to their data to enable this um, overarching sort of baseline overview of global oral health inequality. So that's one example of, of research that is currently taking place. Okay. All right, very good. Well, some active discussion. I think that um, we're all profiting from uh, listening to you. And, and I have to say, I mean, you were really the perfect person to lead this, uh, this commission uh, with the, the oral health series for the Lancet and uh, really bringing together an amazing team uh, certainly you have had an active afterlife and I think really inspiring so many of us in oral health and in dentistry. And it's very exciting how you're continuing to engage so many different stakeholders and hearing how bringing together, uh, you know, the public health components with the biological basis of disease, really working towards this integration at the research level. So uh, we greatly appreciate Richard, your, your presentation today. And uh, this is really part of uh, a series that we're going to have today. Um, so in a um, just about uh, 20 minutes or so, we are going to have a global health uh, town hall that Jane Barrow and her team will be uh, running 
and then at noontime in uh, the Eastern US time frame, I think many people have the, uh, the link to the uh, panel discussion with, uh, again, Professor Watt and Drs. Buckham, Brandt, and Atun on the, the commission itself. And so this will be another great opportunity for uh, individuals to join in. So again, we thank you so much and uh, we really appreciate your time with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.